Hello, my name is Woody. Welcome to the Deftones Nerd Bowl. If you are a fan of Deftones, man, this is it. Roll up, pour something, we're going for it today. My guest is Vezanique, founder of Deftones Live, editor-in-chief, collector, Facebook page, and YouTube manager, more than 32,000 subscribers. If you've watched an old Deftones show online, odds are it was amazing, one. Uh, and it, it was probably also shared by Deftones Live. I'm going to keep it short here to start, but I do want to point out that next week I have an incredible story to share with you. September 19th, 2003, Deftones played their first show at Wembley in London. Yes, it's on Deftones Live. And spoiler alert, Bezanique called it his favorite show in this podcast. But at the end of that concert, they close with change and Chino tosses his guitar into the crowd. My guest next week is the guy who went home with that guitar. His name is Cyrus King and his story is fantastic. Uh, but I wouldn't have found him were it not for Bezanique and Deftones Live. So without further ado or Badu, what if Erica Badu was in the Deftones? I mean, why wouldn't she be, right? Anyways. My conversation with Vezenik. Before we get into Deftones Live, how did you get into Deftones? I got into Deftones. Uh, I was a teenager and I found out about them through Linkin Park. They were, they were covering uh, My Own Summer in 2002 on a tour called uh, Project Revolution, I think it was. And years later, uh, I started collecting bootlegs for Linkin Park. And I found out about this great song that I had been playing. It was My Own Summer. And I bought a round of fur very, very soon after hearing that cover. It was a shitty, but like shitty sounding recording as, as many recordings I have. But uh, yeah, I was intrigued by the sound. I bought a round of fur and from there on started this uh, little fan thing. I think I remember hearing, not live, but a recorded version of... Uh, Lincoln Park doing my own summer and and it was cool like it was a it was legit it was a good cover am I right honestly uh many Deftones fans shit on Lincoln Park but man it was a great cover like true to the sound vocals were great uh I don't know it was, it was just good you know is that true I mean, do, you, do you think a lot of Deftones bands shit on Lincoln Park yeah I mean it's kind of it's kind of something that I discussed on my uh, previous and only first interview is that you know in 2003 like I think um, I think the band was very frustrated with a lot of things and Chino seemed seemed like he was uh, kind of bitter about Linkin Park and Limbiskin and he was he was very vocal about things that year but uh, I can't speak for him you know I just no, but, have but, my fan perspective but. Sure. He had this very, very, let's say, honest op op opinion about Linkin Park and Nimbus Kit. And, you know, since he said those things, I think many fans just, you know, they kind of went on that wagon. You know, they wanted to agree with the singer. And so they would, they would say that. And, of course, I mean, with every... It's something that you learn early on when you get into music is that with anyone getting success, there's going to be some jealousy. And if you're honest about it, Linkin Park were probably the biggest band of our generation. Even if you're not into them when it comes to popularity, man, they were huge and they, are, they still are huge. So you have all those people, you know, being like, yeah, they're commercial, they have a formula, they're not real artists and all that kind of stupid stuff. But uh, I mean, to, come, to go back on that cover, it was just great. It sounded good, well-performed, paying tribute to their big influence i mean what's what's what is what bad thing would you say about that you know it's funny how fans can get carried away though right you know if, if there's even a, a whiff of uh animosity or something man it's like fans are gas on a fire especially now in the internet age um yeah man and even just for me uh as a you know as, as a fan, like I try to remind people as many times as I can that Deftones Life is a fan thing. There is no official affiliation with the label or the band. They might know about it, but I'm this project stands on its own with me and my guys. Uh, shout out to them. And some fans are just, I don't know, I don't know what they think. And I'm not judging, you know, it's just like you read that stuff and you're like, Dude, take a second, like, take a seat back and, you know, I don't know, smoke a joint, drink some water, <laughs> but uh, calm down, you know? Truly, 
Truly. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm entirely certain even over the course of, uh, this podcast, which is still brand new and, and in its uh, earliest stages, uh, I'm, I'm learning things about the band, which is, um, uh, which is awesome. That's like the number one reason why, apart from just wanting to talk about them and, um, and talk about them with other people who love them. Um, uh, I'm learning things about the band that are shedding light on on um, on their you know career and my interpretation of what was going on with the band or where yeah. music was coming from or what songs were about or whatever the case may be. And uh, it's easy to jump to a conclusion. So to get carried away and then shit on Lincoln Park, who really was responsible for I think that second wave of like or really like new metal even being continuing to be viable after Limp Bizkit started to sort of fall off, man, Lincoln Park kept that thing going. Right. And, yeah. and gave a space for a lot of bands that, you know, otherwise wouldn't have been heard. You know, uh, when Defton started up and still to this day, when they make music, they, I've noticed some kind of pattern where they say, uh, you know, we don't have any preconceived idea of what we're going to do. We don't want to be put in a box and, Obviously, artistically, that's that's amazing. But I think Linkin Park were quite the opposite, you know? Like, they came up with a sound, and very early on, on their earliest rehearsals, we were like, we have our sound, there's the rap part, there's the rock part, it's called Hybrid Theory. At the time, they were called Hybrid Theory. And they, you know, they just weren't shy about it. They just went the whole way. And I think that's that's how... They got this respect from people, you know, for, uh, and I mean this respect. No, no, not like the opposite of respect. Like uh, they knew what they wanted. They knew what, what they wanted to create. They weren't lying about it. And it had this honest feel to it. And obviously also it's, uh, it caught up, like it caught up with a lot of troubled kids. Uh, lots of people who had really deep issues and yeah, I think it resonated with so many people and that's why they got so big. Something you just said is uh, something I've been eager to, to talk about with you. Uh, you said you've noticed a pattern. And in the, gosh, how many videos are on Deftones Live? How many, how many live performances roughly would you estimate are on Deftones Live right now? Uh, just on my channel? Yeah, just on uh, your channel. God. Full sets, man. <laughs> a lot, right? Yeah, a lot. You've touched, I think, a, you've touched all of them too, I would imagine. Uh, I I like to believe that I did, but <laughs> <laughs> but you know that's that's also it's also this uh, it's also an interesting part of uh, of this of archiving, and I will uh, I will semi quote uh, this guy. Uh, his name is Hate Five Six. He has this big solo production in a video for hardcore music um i don't know if you heard about him i'm sort of familiar yeah uh well you know he always made he always makes these posts on facebook where he like tries to track down information about recordings or people who made some recordings that he has no info about and man that's fun that's super fun like trying to get trying to get to talk to the right person um, sometimes you will get information you had no idea you would still be able to access to. And just this year, this last two years, Deftones Live got really big. Like we had this really, um, this really, uh, this real big wave of popularity coming to our faces. And so many people have come, uh, have come forward with like, you know, I have this recording, I recorded this, uh, I'm the taper of this, blah, blah. And and things roll out, and you find you find yourself with recordings you had no idea existed, and that that's that's really, you know, it's um, uh, it's it was the um, it was the exciting side of it when I started it as a kid, uh, and it still is to this day. It's like, you know, it's it's like more modern indiana jones uh, looking for a treasure <laughs> <laughs> digital uh, treasures so to speak yeah absolutely so uh how long ha have you been at this then i start i'm 30 now and i started it i was 16 years old wow so the whole idea of um 
of sharing rare recordings with other fans came in my head 14 years ago. At the time, there was this uh, website. It was called, uh, I think it still exists. It's called Band Videos. Okay. Um, I was looking for, uh, obviously, recordings of Deftones on stage. And this website had um, a huge library of uh, recordings of many bands, including Deftones. And, you know, it was the streaming technology of the time using really, really bad uh, quality sources of those recordings. But I would see exactly at this time, YouTube was getting really big. And to mention Linkin Park again, um, they were one of the first bands to to explode on that side, you know, having people upload their live recordings. Sure. And I saw some kind of opportunity there, you know, I was like, man, if this works for Linkin Park, there's no reason. There's no, re like, if there are so many people interested in live recordings of Linkin Park, there's got to be maybe not the same amount, but the same passion in some people. And they want to see the same stuff. but for Deftones and I also noticed that getting rare recordings of those bands was it was a it was a little harder than just you know looking up this band live on Google and downloading from somewhere you actually had to know people you had to get into the right circles um, and so basically the idea was to break the wall between the between uh, those uh, close clubs and the mainstream uh, because I thought you know it's it's great it's great if you're such a fan that you're gonna you're gonna include a private club where we can have rare stuff but it's kind of selfish in a way and that was my opinion at the time i was a kid you know now i get the point and i probably pissed off some traders over time but uh <laughs> no no regrets no regrets at all and so yeah 2006 i think i founded my first channel uh and that was that's been the same idea since then. I mean, I've been aware of it. Uh, I, I can. I was in college in the uh, early 2000s, 2005 is when I graduated. So um, I can remember being in my dorm room, like looking for Deftones videos. And there's like the, um, there's there was like a handful of them. There just weren't that many. I, yeah, I, I remember absolutely. watching the same ones over and over. And I know, over. <laughs> like the yeah. Bazaar Fest or something. A performance of Lotion was up there. Was up, um, and then you know, so it was all pro shot stuff. None of it was what you've done, which is yeah, really, like you're restoring like bad video and audio, and and a lot of times you're patchworking, uh, like cell phones, exactly, like. That's that's something that would was certainly not in your mind's eye back then and when you started, right? This is sort of what it's evolved into. Yeah, I mean all those um all those ideas I came up with uh through time just happened as I said, through time, you know. They would just come to me and like I would see uh most of the time the most interesting thing would have would be like like a show would have been recorded uh, by an amateur on camera. And then if you were lucky enough, it had aired on radio or the soundboard got out there um, in some way. And I was like, you know, here's an ID, you know, like I got to put that together. <laughs> and that's, uh, yeah, it comes, it comes with time, you know, and passion. You're just like looking at these things and these ideas that came up on their own. And you're like, man, that makes sense. I got, I got to do this. And uh, sometimes it's even simpler. Like you will have, like I said, an amateur video source and someone and the sound is bad, but someone has recorded it with a better mic and uh, you put those sources together. And that's really, that's really the whole point of the channel is really upload uh, mo most of the time when I can unseen footage or audio recording. But my favorite part is probably restoring like you said the recordings that are the most known and really provide with the better source possible um because i think i think it's in it's interesting you know i compare the, ch the channel to uh to a couple of ones that are similar uh, like uh, tool archive or for tool or obey your system for system of a down and as much as I like what they do, especially to, to Archive, I'm not such a fan of uh, 
obey your system. No dissing, but there's a couple of things that I wouldn't do. I just don't like them. But if I compare the stuff that I do to those guys uh, or those girls, whoever is in charge, um, I, you know, I think uh, that's why Deftones Live is, a, that's, that's what makes Deftones Live stand out is that I provide with stuff that's already there, but in a better quality, in the best quality possible. Because at the end of the road, like, I don't know, it's just that more enjoyable, you know? If, like, you were mentioning those uh, videos uh, that were on YouTube back then, 2006, 2007, when you were in your dorm, and if you remember, the quality was terrible. And in some way, it adds to the mystique of it, you know? Like, Absolutely. you're, like, in, in the back seat, you're like, man, I, I wish I could see this in better quality. And, and so for me... In the time frame, it, it works, you know, because <laughs> yeah. all those years you got had those really bad quality recordings. And now I come up uh, out of the blue with uh, with these uh, better sources and it kind of helps you. It kind of helps you as a fan to keep the excitement going, you know, and the interest and the passion. Well, it's it's disruptive, isn't it? When you uh, have shitty audio, for lack of a better word, I mean, I'm a little bit of an audiophile, not um an expert by any means but like i can i can determine when i might be able to clean something up or something and and it's it's hard to hear stuff that that you know is just it's awful but could be better yeah yeah especially with experience because right. you know i was really really less of a purist before back then anything would have done anything <laughs> it really did it really did Anything stamped Deftones on it, even if it Give sounded it bad, I wouldn't have noticed. I would, ju- I would have just been like, I would have this huge adrenaline or serotonin rush in my head where I would be like, fuck, man, new Deftones live. But I'll uh, take it. Yeah, <laughs> I totally know what you mean. You know, that so, mystique that you talk about, that, that uh, it, it really brings to mind one in particular, which I don't think is yours, this video of them in the McDonald's parking lot. I'm sure oh, you know. Yeah. Of course, because um, yeah, yeah. that's like it's like a block and a half from where I work, that that McDonald's parking lot. So like I I would I have <laughs> Is literally it still there. I guess it's, oh yeah, it's still there. It's uh yeah. it's on the University of Minnesota campus, um so it's uh it's right in the middle of the neighborhood attached to the University of Minnesota called Dinky Town, and uh, it is it's there. It's a little bit different. I'm told. I just had a conversation with somebody who was there, and it was yeah. actually I it was a promotion. Um, hosted by the radio station that I that I work at, so like I'm learning these things that I had no idea uh, about. But that mystique is already there, even though it's that you know sketchy, grainy video, and yeah, <laughs> um, it's in a McDonald's parking lot. Like, but there's a lot of that out there. There's 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 stuff like that that exists. Yeah, I think you know as a band, I think that was one of their most uh, I wouldn't say selling points, but like. It's something that held them in the long run. Like there's some stuff that not it's not it's not hidden, but it is just not in plain sight. And that's what that's what caught up to me, you know. I was like, I want to find out more about them. And that's how they got me. <laughs> that's how oh, they got me under their ranks as a fan. You know, I was like, I want to find out more. Like um an example that comes to my head is this one video of uh Nigel Bat from the White Pony tour where Chino sounds amazingly good. Uh, the old version of it, until, until a couple of months ago, the only version of it available was uh, this really grainy, um, this really grainy, uh, it didn't sound bad. Like, of course, it didn't sound pristine because of the, the generation of the recording, but, but the, the image, it was kind of weird. It was kind of weird. It has this. It had this. Uh, this a natural blue tint to it. Uh, it had. It had taken some damage. And I learned over time that this. Uh, this source was a third generation VHS. For anyone listening to this, I may be. I may be wrong about this, but uh, basically, a third generation VHS is a copy of a copy of the copy of the master source. And with VHS, is back. That's back in back in the day. If you made a copy. Unless you really put the work in, it would take some damage on the first copy. And then again, you would copy it, some more damage, and then and another copy, and then some more damage. And uh, that's why you would end up with very, very bad quality recordings over time, is that 
the only people that would share them would be the one that had the fourth or the fifth or the tenth copy of it. And uh, this one video of Digital Bath, it was a third one. It was a third generation. I think I got the not the studio master from the TV channel, but the the first VHS capture from TV. And uh, I had some guy, his name was, um, God, I forgot. Sorry, man, if you're listening to this, I totally forgot about your name. I'm sorry. But he did some color correction on, uh, on the video. And I wouldn't say he'd lost it lost its, its touch because Chino still sounds amazingly good. And it's, and it's great to be able to see that performance in, with a clear view. But seeing, seeing it with that bad quality back in the day, it was definitely more impactful when it comes to that mystique and leaving me hungry for more, you know? Mm -hmm. so, um, so now to go back to your previous question, uh, I'm more of a purist, but I, st I need for, for this to work. I need to be able to get in the back seat and be like, okay, this sounds like shit to me, but there's probably a lot of people who want to hear this anyway. You yeah. Know? So fuck it. I'll share it. Yeah. It's worth it to, if, to catalog it. Right. To, yeah. To if it's, it if it's thing. really like, you know, you can't make any instrument out or it, it actually hurts my ears. I won't share it. <laughs> then you'll draw but the line. <laughs> if I see some potential and I see there's enough interest, I'm like, yeah, man, it's not just about me. It's, it's also about all the other fans. So, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, um, just to, to go back on, your, on one of your previous questions, I have over 100 videos on YouTube. I don't know how many of them are full sets. Um, maybe half of that, maybe more. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there so, there's a lot of Deftone sets. Out and you've there. watched? I mean, you've watched them all. You you've have I watched them all? Most of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Most, uh, most of them. <laughs> and I might get shot in the foot by someone for saying this, but most of them, uh, before Cheese Accident, I I still followed them faithfully after Cheese Accident and followed most of the set lists and. Uh, and I would always catch at least a little footage on every tour, but some tours I've completely left out. I haven't, I haven't even, uh, I haven't even watched. Um, Is that because of your musical interest, or because um, the fact that Deftones Live Archive has become like uh, its work? Or, uh, or I, I don't want to put words in your mouth either. Though. No, I think you know. I think with time. Uh, I think Deftone just, they just care about having a good time on stage more so than they did when they were touring the self-title or Saturday Night Wrist. Back in those days, um, if you pay attention to it, like you kind of noticed that they, they, they cared about having better crafted shows with interesting satellites and, um, and for someone like me, it's way more interesting to have a show like that. But with time, it's not like they never changed the set list, but in my humble, honest opinion, and they, if they hear this, I don't mean to be a prick, you guys, but um, I don't know. Sometimes you like, you kind of wish you would be daring to switch things up a little more, a little more often. Mm. Uh, I know I will quote Chino uh, and say, um, a couple of times since the Diamond Eyes touring cycle, every time he would come up with this statement and say, uh, we've been rehearsing hard and even a few songs that we never played, it honestly, it almost never happened. But I will set the record straight and say that myself, I have witnessed a song that they had never played and they have never played again. So, you know, it's not like they never do it. Are you talking about Smile? Uh, not smile, no. Uh, it was combat. Oh, really? From Saturday Night Wrist. Yeah. When and where? It was in 2011 in Amsterdam. It's a, it's a pretty. <laughs> if I can, if I can rent Please. just a little more, um, uh, that position I told you about, it was a pretty, it was a pretty, it was pretty common among fans, especially at that time in the in the Diamond Eye cycle. Most setlists were almost the same every day to the point where fans were like, man, where is Saturday Night Wrist? Where is the self-title? It's only over time that Chino admitted that he didn't really want to play stuff from those albums anymore. But um, 
we we didn't know about that and we couldn't we couldn't have guessed it right because we love those records a not a different way than he does right and so before the amsterdam show it was in 2011 in june uh no in august in august and we knew that the diamond eyes tour was coming to an end so we kind of like wanted to take the shot at maybe asking them straight up to change up the set list. And so we threw, <laughs> we threw this uh, petition on uh, Twitter, I think it was. We asked people, uh, fans around us, from, from the Sharing Lungs forum, by the way, which is the forum attached to Deftones World, who used to be and probably still is the biggest Deftones site, Deftones fan site. It has been um, ages since I've been to Deftones World, but I remember being there and on the Sharing Lungs uh, board it's still there man it's really it's still there yeah i mean i'm and, talking uh, this is almost 20 years ago this was yeah, again when i, I was in I college know. and there was <laughs> nothing else there yeah nuno the owner uh he became a friend with time and uh yeah he still is like he's not as deep into it as he used to be because um because you know he, he had he obviously has a life and he yeah. he moved on to other things but he's still he's still a fan he's still a fan and every every touring cycle not not every touring cycle but every album cycle he's going to post this man mandatory uh update on deftones world and uh, just recently <laughs> he redid the layout of sharing lungs that's the first wow. <laughs> in the first in 20 years he he redid the layout on sharing yeah, lungs. To crack his knuckles and get back get ready to get back to work right yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> i hadn't i hadn't seen him post in maybe i don't know two three years and then all of a sudden bam he gets on the uh the ohms bandwagon like uh Gotta make a full-fledged post about the promo and all that like very slick very pro that's cool you that's know? great so you put a petition on the sharing lungs message board and and people got behind it the band somehow yeah. got it um well i'm not i'm not sure that they did here here's how it happened like a couple of us at sharing lungs we posted our messages on our profiles asking other fans to do the same and uh if i remember well quite a few fans did and <laughs> you know what I, God, I remember this so well. I almost was about not to go because I almost didn't have any money. And I was like, I have to be more reasonable and save the little money that I have. I love this band, but I probably can't go. And the same day, Deftones post on their Facebook something that they never post. They say, all right, you guys, what do you want to hear? Wow. They, never, they never do that. They never do that. They never did it again. So I'm like, oh shit, I gotta go. <laughs> I gotta go. So <laughs> buy my tickets. I go to the to the train station in like one hour. Like uh I maybe I ran a little, you know, just the crazy fan. But uh yeah, I took the train, went up there. We were I was there pretty early and I met a couple of guys from the from the Shingle Lungs Forum. And there we catch Chino. No way. And yeah, it was one we right there, and you know what? In retrospect, if you hear this man, I'm sorry. I know I freaked you out, <laughs> but <laughs> no, like I, I so vividly remember this. Like he was walking with some guy, um, I don't know who, and I see him, and I'm like, "Hey, Chino," and you know, I shake his hand, but I have, I have this big smile on my face, and he probably saw me and was like, "Who the fuck is that?" <laughs> 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 and you know like i i cringed a little when i thought back about it I was like man that was that was not smooth <laughs> but uh you know it was all in the heart i just i just wanted to say hi honestly i just wanted to say hi but then i um yeah so i see him and you know i'm not i'm not about to follow him or anything i just you know him going his way and then i i meet the guys from sharing longs and we start talking about what we did on Twitter and the, the post that we saw on, on the Deftones Facebook. And uh, we're like, you know, you think something's going to happen? You think like maybe, you know, we're all really anticipated, anticipating and excited. And then Chino comes our way. And he didn't mean, he didn't mean to meet us. He, like the place he needed need to go happened to be on that way. So one of them, I, I already told him, I, I had already greeted him. So I was like, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to bother him again. But one of the guys in the group was like, hey, Chino, can we talk? And can we have a chat? And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so, so cool. and we have this really cool chat for like half an hour about the set lists and about <sighs> the songs that they play. And it was, 
it was really was really interesting because I don't I don't remember any interview and I, I I've heard and read a lot of them where Chino talk talks so deep about about the set list. It was really cool. Like one thing that I remember well is that we 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 talked about a few a few more rare songs like mascara lucky you um really deep alternative alternative cuts and he revealed that at some point he actually wanted to make a full fledged tour with only um yeah deeper cuts um Man. slower songs and all that and how cool would that be <laughs> you know it maybe it was you know some kind of id he's never going to look into again but just to hear about that from from chino was like man that, that's so cool that's so cool and at some point here's what happened and here's why i heard combat i believe that's the reason and i'm going to tell you why <laughs> i i talked to and i had read this interview um or maybe it was a rumor i'm not sure but basically i heard that they wouldn't play combat because chino had trouble singing those parts and playing guitar at the same time because your know, combat is a really demanding song, mm. especially vocally. And uh, I, all I did, all I did, I swear to God, all I did was asking the question. I was like, you know, is it true that that you guys struggle to play combat because it's a hard song to play? And I didn't mean anything by it. I didn't like, I didn't like imply that it was such a bad performer or anything like that. I was just genuinely curious about it because combat is a great song to me, and I would I would love to hear it live. And Saturday Night Race had been out for five years and they had never played it. So I just, I just asked the question. That's all I did. But then the show happened. <laughs> the show happened and they bust out combat. I went apeshit, man. Like there's, there's a couple of angles on YouTube from that, uh, from that song that was gonna be my quite next question did you record it <laughs> uh, I, I, did, I did not record it but three people did i made a multicam i think recently i took those three angles and put them together um but <laughs> that's so cool i love the idea that chino was like they said what now they that's oh, <laughs> oh i can't perform you know it. What? that's exactly what happened and dude that's I, I, I had I had yeah. no clue. I had no clue that was the reason. I was like, you know, maybe if I heard us out, maybe if I heard I didn't even think about it to be honest. Like they started playing that song, I went ape shit. I was like, fuck, it's combat. Man. <laughs> it's so funny to me that um in a lot of ways they hang their hat on their live show. It's it's like nobody else's as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I'm I've been to a, a, a good number of shows, but nobody Nobody does it live on stage like they do. And, and to hear a song like that, oh, man. Yeah, man. And it wasn't, uh, you know what? I, I'm just, I'm just going to take it up real quick. Because that set list, it was insane. And again, this um, was 2011-ish? That's right. Yeah. I, okay. It was at the end. I, it may have been the last, the last show of the Diamond Eye Cycle. Hold on. No, it wasn't the last, but it was, it was in those few last couple of weeks. And and had you started uh, Deftones live to that at that point? Yeah, it wasn't as serious as it is now, uh, but I think it might have been different from Deftones live at the time. I I yeah. was I was still solo, and I think I used to go by my by my nickname Vizinik. But uh, the idea was already there. I, I named it Deftones Live, I think it was a couple of years ago, because I started including more people. And I didn't want him to feel like, you know, um, this is one guy's work and he's not crediting me or anything like that. So, right. And besides, I saw what Tool Archive and Obey Your System were doing. I was like, man, that was the idea from the start. So let's, let's just name it something Deftones, you know? So, yeah. And yeah. I was like, Deftones Live. Okay, sold. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's to the point. I'm having a hard time naming this podcast because I can't, I can't figure out what's a great name for the pod. Um, so uh, did you find, that, did you find that, uh, that show, that set list? Yeah. Uh, so the standouts... There was um, Royal, <sighs> Kim Dracula. Man, I love Kim Dracula. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Cherry Waves, 
So that was, oh man, that was that. That's what made it even better. They played, they played uh, Kim Dracula and Cherry Ways back to back. So that was already like two Saturday Night Raw songs, which was unreal yeah. for that era. And after Cherry Ways, they kicked into combat. Man, I was on the moon. I was on the fucking moon. Uh-huh. <laughs> after that, they busted out Elite. Uh, and after that, that that finished me. That totally finished me. Yeah. They played The Boys Republic. Oh, no way. Really? Dude, I swear to God. <laughs> Holy I shit. Can, I can remember it so vividly. I was like a kid, I swear. I see Chino uh, playing this little guitar thing and i couldn't make it out it took me like a couple of seconds and then i turned down to melvin a fellow a fellow fan i was like shit it's the boys republic <laughs> you know, wow, totally crazed dude. out you may um, want to go pull out the set list because i have uh my set list somewhere here in my in my office from that um from that yeah t- i bought like the meet and greet package but you know what? That's what that's what I that's why I want to say. Like they could get more experimental in set lists, but as far as I go, I got lucky. Like a couple yeah. of times, I got very lucky with their set lists. Yeah. I remember this one show. It was in Belgium. Um, you know what? I'm gonna pull it off because I'm, I'm gonna take it up too. Because at the time, I thought, dude, this is an unusual set list. Even for that tour, it doesn't mm-hmm. make sense. And to this day, if you compare it to the previous day and the next day and the previous days, you, you have no idea where the set list came from. Uh, it was on the 23rd of November, 2010. They, they opened with Royal. They never did it before. And I swear to God, they never did it again. I love that uh, song. The last 30 seconds of that song are just maybe some of my favorite moments in recorded music. I just love that. It's pretty great, yeah. Uh, they play the uh, Labia, Needles and Pins, Hexagram, Kim Dracula, Hole in the Earth, <laughs> Korea, Lotion. Uh, like, what? <laughs> they, they played Risk as well, uh, which, was, which wasn't still as a rarity. Yeah, man. Like, and I got, I got lucky like that a couple of times when I saw them. The you, first, the yeah. first show of the Gore Tour I was there was uh, I reckon it was in in Vienna. Uh, they played Street Carp. Nobody recorded it, Whoa. unfortunately. But they played Street Carp, and they did not play it again on that tour. God knows why. It sounded amazing, but yeah, I got I got lucky a couple of times. But I want to quote Chino again and say that. Uh, so every cycle, he says that they've been rehearsing rare songs that they never played. Combat was the only case of that happening. And not dissing, you know, I totally appreciate it. Probably if I was an artist, like, I would be nervous too. But there was this interview. I don't remember who it was with. But he said, you know, sometimes we think about coming out on stage with a totally different set list, with only deeper cuts. Because when you think about it, you're like, it's a great idea. But then the show gets closer and you're like, uh, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. you know i i, I kind of get it there's a nervosity and there's like the fear to disappoint people and bump them out especially mm-hmm. if they come to the show to hear like change or back to school but um you know as a fan like me i'm like man try it out it's your music you don't have anything to prove anymore like yeah but that, that's just my view that's no just I, I i think you're to, i think you're onto something um I've thought about that. I went to the last two um, or the only two Dia de los Deftones shows and I was like, and they played 90 minutes. You know, I was like, what? Play, play two or three hours. You, you guys are Deftones. You, you yeah, got it. A lot of people expected that actually. <laughs> you I guys got like, it. What was that in the comments was like, dude, it's your festival. Like play all the songs you want and play yeah. longer. And yeah. I, I agreed. You know, I was like, they have a point. <laughs> they have a point. I'm not, I'm not in the band. I have no way, yeah. you know. And I'm not mad. I would have hoped for it, you know what I mean, because of that uh, opportunity in a two-hour set to hear the, the, the unique stuff. Yeah. Just for, the, for that reason, you know. Are there any, are there any shows out there, any white whales, uh, any um, uh, performances that you know about or... Um, yeah that you haven't gotten your hands on or uh, things that you've wanted to document or oh um, yeah <laughs> to touch yeah can you talk about there's, those yeah there's um there's just one like there's maybe two but the second is a bit silly uh the main one is the um, the first show of the white pony tour it was on the 24th of may 
in Petaluma in California. And the reason I'm so, so interested in this show is because it's possibly the only time they play my favorite song, which is uh, Pink Maggot. It's, really? Uh, you think they've only played it once? I mean, I guess it's kind, of a, it's kind of a song, right? It's kind of an experiment yeah. to, to perform. Is... You know what? I know it sounds super unlikely because it's been 20 years since it came out, but I've done my research and everything points out to the possibility that it's maybe the only time they did. Maybe, you know what? They played two nights in a row, on the 24th and on the 25th. So maybe they played it on the second night as well. But I only have the set list of the first night. This was confirmed to me by, uh, by a fan who was there. His name is uh, Derek Moore. Uh, rest in peace, because he passed away, sadly. But uh, yeah, he confirmed to me that he witnessed that song live. And honestly... That's the only reason I started collecting live recordings because I wanted to find a live recording of my favorite song and I never did. So that's why this collection got so big is because there, if you look up on YouTube, Google, any, anywhere you want, you will not find a live recording of Pink Maggot. You won't. And the reason I believe it's possibly the only time we played it, it's because, um, well, first of all, I have pretty much all the set lists from the white pony tour uh i know it sounds super freaky but it's the truth <laughs> i think that's really cool so don't don't be shy around me i think that's amazing so like they played uh they played petaluma on the 24th and the 25th the show after that was at hf festival on the 28th and every set list from there on pretty much every set list from there on is accessible is available and they did not play Pink Maggot again for some reason. And then in July, or maybe it was August, they reissued White Pony with Back to School. And the earliest performance of Back to School that I know about was early August. You know? So really small time frame. And I think what happened is that ever since they re-released White Pony, uh -huh. They just played back to school instead yeah. of Pink it bullied Maggot. Pink Maggot off the list because it was exactly. I mean, it's it's a live song. Back, back yeah. to school is a live song. It's 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 I know. well, they wrote it for as a pop song, right? Or they wrote it as a song to be popular and catchy or whatever. Yeah. Yep, so. I know for a fact. Like I, I definitely know for a fact that they used some parts of Pink Maggot here and there. Like mm. like for example, Steph would uh, play the intro notes as a show intro or as an interlude sometimes chino would sing the chorus out of the blue but um as far as playing the full song i am pretty sure it only happened once twice max that's and cool. that's that's the one thing i've been after ever since i uh, i i started this thing quite a you, rabbit hole you found yourself tumbling down i know <laughs> <laughs> i know dude you know what uh Two weeks ago, I, I almost jumped out of my couch, you know, because, you know, doing the thing that I do, obviously, I look up the Deftones term on YouTube all the time and check out the latest uploads. I do that like maybe two or three weeks ago, and I see this upload, Deftones, Petaluma, 24th of May, 2000. You get fucking just shaking, right? Dude, like, <laughs> I was like, holy shit, this is it. This is it. 15 years in the making, this is it. Oh, my God. <laughs> I can move on with my life after this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what? Like, I don't believe in God. I'm not a believer. I don't have faith. But this, the, the belief that I'm going to find this someday is what keeps me going in this thing, in this, in this Deftones thing. So I was like, oh, shit, it's happening. It's happening. But then I'm like, oh, no. I see the length of the video. It was 20 minutes. Uh, and I, the show was probably like, you know, when I were in the house, something like that. Yeah. So I'm like, dude, no, no, don't tell me he got busted while recording. Fuck no. And then I check out the upload. Uh, his handle is uh, from the nosebleeds, by the way. He recorded a lot of great shows uh, in the Bay Area of many famous bands. Uh, shout out to him if he happens to listen to this. That's cool. Uh, but yeah, what happened is that he was recording and he caught, you know, he caught a great before performances of uh, Damon, the hidden song in, in Ralifer. He caught the first live perf performance ever of Change. 
Wow. And uh, maybe there's even Fatty Sierra in there. I don't know. But basically, yeah, the security cut him short after 20 minutes. So uh-huh. before he had the chance to record Pink Maggot, which was the closing track. So, wow. yeah. <laughs> so I was like, man, this is, this is just never going to happen. Because if they did it with him, they probably did it with all the tapers there. Yeah. And it probably happened on the second night as well. Granted that they, that they even played Pink Maggot on the second night. Yeah. So, yeah, I just got... I'm slowly accepting the fact that if they don't play White Pony uh, front to back as a celebration someday, I'm just never going to hear that song live. But you know what? I heard that recently. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. And in this mm-hmm. case, it's really true. Like, if I had found Pink Maggot live right away, that song's live wouldn't exist. Like, truth be told, like, I wouldn't be, I, w- I would still be a fan, obviously, but I wouldn't have built this. You know, I love sharing with people. I love that. But I had my own selfish interest in this. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's white and black. Yeah. And yeah, it's, 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 it was a great experience. So my, my last hope, <laughs> my last hope is them having played White Pony from to back, front to back someday. Or if they happen to, ke- to keep the, the, soundboard, the soundboard recording of that show, maybe maybe someday get access to it in uh in some way i don't know how because i know i i don't think very into very into that like i know i know they keep shows i know they collect i know that for a fact but i know they're not into publicly archiving their stuff or make it accessible i mean there's there's experience that talks about that chino in 2003 he uh he leaked bootlegs um about 47 audio bootlegs he leaked them really uh, live yeah. live shows, live bootlegs. Yeah, yeah, live bootlegs. It was on their website, and uh, it got <laughs> it got pulled out by the label. <laughs> and then uh, he went on Dang. this interview, and he was like, "Yeah, management took him out because apparently we had the right to the music or whatever." I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, I wonder if that has something to do with it. I wonder if it has to do with their ownership. And well, I'm I'm purely speculating, but it is curious that they wouldn't given again how. Um, significant their live show is to yeah. their story that they like it blows my mind that there hasn't been like a really uh complete or any sort of live album i mean there's some there's like a short uh like eight songs uh cd is when it when it came out years and years ago that i have but that's like the only thing that seems official as far as yeah as far as live album live. goes right yeah 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 it was called it was called deftones live i think as a matter of fact. Yeah. And this was recorded in Amsterdam in 1997. Uh, I know because, um, because one of my teammates at Deftones Live, he was there. He was at that show. Oh, rad. And uh, his name is Sly. He used to run uh, Dutch Deftones. I don't know if you remember that. I don't remember just Deftones, no. It was du- Dutch Deftones. Oh, the Dutch Deftones. No, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't remember... Well, I'm, I may not have been very adept in my early days with the internet. Uh, that's, that's fine. But uh, Sly, yeah, he, uh, he's, a, he's an old school fan. Way he was, he was into it way before I was. And uh, he has a great history of the band. It's, it's amazing. Like, like uh, I, I just have this one story. And he will say it himself if he has the opportunity, which I think he will have at some point. But in 1998, I think it was, in maybe... January, they had just they had just come back to Europe for their second tour ever there, and they played um, they played two nights in a row in the Netherlands, which is where Sly comes from. And he got on the bus with the band, and Sly is the graphic designer. And if you're a Deftones fan and you looked up Deftones graphics before, you may have caught some Sly bootlegs that ended up being so fucking popular that people believe it's official. Really? I swear to God. Like, there's this, uh, there's this one artwork from the Diamond Eye Cycle. You can see, you can see the owl, uh, but not, not, the, not the one that's on the cover. It's one from the side, and it's blue. I've, I've, that sounds really familiar to me. Yeah, it got, it's super popular. But then you know what? It's, it's, it's a bootleg made by Sly, and now it's being sold on eBay and all that. Wow. And, 
all, so many, so many of his Death, Deftones graphics, and that ended up being used as, you know, fake official merch. <laughs> There's a lot of that. There's like a whole market of, uh, of yeah, unofficial man. Deftones products. But yeah, going back to 1988, he got, he got in the bus and um, he told me the story like, apparently the band tried to track him down for his art because they were interested in collaborating with him. Uh, it, it didn't happen eventually, but yeah. That, that's cool that, as hell. That story happened. I know, I know he meets them any chance he can and they're always super cool with him because they know what he does. They know about his fandom. And... Uh, he has he has a thing like me. It's called um, it's called uh, Deftones Archive. Okay. Uh, it's it's very big on uh, Instagram and on Facebook as well, I believe. Oh yeah, I follow that on uh, on Instagram. I just started. I just really started voraciously like following all of the Def- Deftones sites and hashtags and different. Yeah, it's some of them are like I followed one on Instagram, Chino Moreno Sex Party or something. I was like, well, this feels <laughs> awkward, but I'm gonna follow it. Yeah, but there was some. There was a really cool video from. Uh, like 98 that I'd never seen before. Chino's like cutting the grass in this produced promo for a show, I think. And it was like, well, I got to follow this account now. Cause I don't know. Yeah. Where they- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We try, you know, there's a, uh, there's a lot of people who collect Deftones recordings and, uh, and pictures, but Sly and I um, on Deftones live and, and he on his Deftones archive. And we try to, we try to make it look professional in a way, you know, in a way that's both interesting and also that's not clickbaity, you know. Mm-hmm. We're trying to make an actual, yeah. we're trying to make it look like a proper clean archive. And it's, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned this weird account, Chino, Six Party or whatever, because uh, <laughs> as much as a freaky fan as I am when it comes to the, the intensity of my fandom, I always draw a line between the music and them like i see so many people sharing pictures of chino's wedding or chino's kids or the wife of this guy or you know personal stuff and when i see that i'm like nah man come on don't do that like i I, like if if that's their way to to be fans like it's it's their it's their thing it's their life i don't judge but it's just not my stuff, you know. It's just I I don't need that. I always only ever cared about what the sound that they make on stage, and that's about it. I don't want. I don't need to hear. I don't need to know when they take a shit. I don't need to know what they eat. I don't need to know what the name of their girlfriend was when they grew up. All I care about is the sound that they make when they go on that fucking stage. That's all I'm interested in. I love so, that. Uh, I love and that. I think, I think people see that. You know, I think people. I think that's why we have such a following now is that they they see how serious we are about this and we really don't care about bothering the band. We just want to pay tribute to content that's already there and that we can improve. That's that's it. I think that's terrific. Uh in talking about um your your team, is it just the two of you that are that are I mean, obviously you've got people who are sending you and contributing stuff, but um uh, Yeah. So I started up alone. Uh, this was, I, I guess this was my idea, if you could say that, although many other people have the same idea. So I don't like saying that it's my idea, but I, I guess I popular, I popularized it. And I did hear a couple of times from people who are, or were close to the band that, that I definitely, the work that I've, that I've provided helped uh, reinvigorate the, the, the fan community. And it's always great to hear that you're like, you know, this work meant something to some people. That's great. So I started up. I started off alone. I got into the community very early on, obviously, and I, I made friends with uh, a few other guys. And I started what was gonna be Deftones Live in 2006. And then a few years ago, I realized, you know what? I won't be able to do this alone. <laughs> if I want to make some kind of chronology and a project that works i i can't do this alone there's just too much there's i can't and it was hundreds of shows a year at one point right and at one point in their career there was they were literally performing hundreds of shows absolutely yeah it was a hard blow to take because you know i'm I'm pretty proud and i don't like asking for help it's not my, my strong asset but i was like you know fuck it if i do that it's gonna grow into something more beautiful so let's go for it 
And uh, I think the first person that I recruited was a guy that sadly I had to let go of because of, um, of something that he did, but I'm not going to get into that. Um, and then realizing this was a fruitful collaboration, I was like, man, I should, I should make a whole team. So I hired people that I knew I could trust that had, that I had been friends with, uh, for a long time, except for one of them. But I trusted him enough because um, he was the moderator on the subreddit of Deftones. Oh, cool. So I was like, you know, if he has such a care about the community, he's not going to mess this up if we include it in the team. That subreddit is, I'm, I'm relatively new to Reddit itself. Like, it's just not something that I'm, I've been diving into until I decided that this was a project that I wanted to endeavor on. That's a tight subreddit. That is a tightly... I think I've seen you post in there a couple of times about, hey, we're, yeah. we're not sharing <laughs> stuff that's, uh, that's bootlegged or leaked. We're, we're keeping it tight with ohms and that sort of stuff, which is a pretty Absolutely. cool thing and respectful. And that's... I mean, and I'll, I'll be super honest because I don't want to walk away from this. Like uh, the, previous, the previous album cycles, I probably helped leak the music and sue me. Like I won't even be able to pay so you guys can sue me, but... Uh, I'm not the one who leaked it. I'm not the original leak, but like if I got the link to that one leak, I probably gave it to a lot of people. I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I was that guy. And I'm in, ret- in retrospect, I'm sorry. It was irresponsible. Hey, man, you're Robin Hood. As far as I'm concerned. Uh, <laughs> you know what? I used to see myself like that. And I was like, dude, stop <laughs> being such a narcissistic asshole and pay respect to the man who, who gave you uh, such an interest. So but uh, no, like, and this one, this time, this, this time around, I, I kind of, uh, not only I, I wanted to help them out, but I wanted to redeem myself in some way. So I was like, you know, if I can help, I will. And yeah, there's been, I've heard of Lee here and there and whatever, but I'm not doing that. Like I, yeah. I know I, I, I realized over time the influence that I have on this community <laughs> And I'm like, I'm not helping that. I'm not, you know, I'm, some people will still do it. I'm not delusional. You know, some people have heard them and more people are hearing them every day. But the minutes I spread them, I know it's going to be way more general. Yeah. Yeah. Your reach is pretty big now. I mean, you've got a lot, like 30 some thousand subscribers on your (laughs) your channel. That's, that's not a drop in the bucket. That's a pretty big swath of Deftones fans. Yeah. When it comes exactly. to the the album itself, like there's just I don't know, there's something nice about waiting. There there are a few surprises left in life. Like yeah. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to join the boomer opinion and say like that us kids uh and emphasis on kids, but like uh we can't wait for stuff like they used to do because now we have internet and blah, 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 blah. But no, <laughs> but we are definitely used to getting stuff in advance. That's for sure. And as for me, uh, I don't know about you, but we look like we're from pretty much from the same generation. I was at this crossroads where as a kid, I had to wait for things. And then the internet became popular and I didn't have to wait for things anymore. As a kid, I would need to rent movies, to buy CDs. Mm. Uh, as a teenager, I only had to download them and, or stream them, and I had them in a second. So there was definitely this, um, this anticipation that got lost along the way. You know, yeah. this like, you know, wait for it when it's supposed to drop. In this day and age, it's almost impossible, man. Boy, like, but our favorite band sure has a good has a has a knack for it, though, right? I mean, we've been yeah. waiting two years now for for ohms. It's, uh... <laughs> Dude, it's it's huge. Like I, I'll, I'll say this: being a moderator on Sharing Longs, Deftones Live, and the Reddit, I've had to delete so many messages and oh, call so many people out on what they would do. I felt like you know, I felt like the annoying father or the annoying teacher. <laughs> Um, and so, someone, someone said this on Sharing Lungs. I feel like Vesanique is, uh, is the teacher in a classroom full of kids on cocaine. <laughs> Honestly, this, the anticipation of this album, it's exactly what it feels like. It's been so long since they came, they, they came, they came out with new music. Yeah. We've heard about this new album for the first time a couple of years ago. Uh, now the, the album has been pushed back because of the pandemic. So 
the the hype the hype is huge, man. And I can't say this uh, for why Pony or the Self Title because I was not a fan back back then, but I heard it from a couple of older fans who say this hype is like is unlike anything they have seen. Mm. Uh, they they were in the cycle for White Pony, and they were like even then it was huge, but it wasn't like now. People are getting crazy about this. It's true. The life of this band has definitely been um, one of the most intriguing things to me because I think about that time back then and most of my friends didn't really like them. They didn't like Deftones. I, I, I remember the girlfriend I had at the time said, we're, you're going to listen to Deftones again. Like, <laughs> it's so sad. Stop making, every time I hear them, it makes me sad. And I'm like, really? Because this sadness fills me with joy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, I get it. But there weren't that many. And now this community is somehow over the past, you know, 20 years, like it's really, it's, it's become a giant. I mean, you see people sharing Deftones family, Deftones familia, and it's, it's across the board. And then going to Dia de los Deftones for me, um, not to interject myself too much into this conversation, but um, it really felt like that. It felt like a, a collection of people coming together who had been, you know, uh, spread out over the world and, and we're finally coming to like this family reunion in a sense, because we're, we're all just here for the love of the band. You know what I mean? And totally. It's a, it's an interesting dynamic now. Cause you think about back then, you know, they weren't the first band in their scene that was talked about or not really the second or the third or the fourth. And then when Lincoln park came along that again, sort of uh, became, they became the forefront of the conversation. Yeah, you know, I think, I think, like you said, it's interesting because I know that when they were just a touring band uh, from Sacramento that they didn't have a contract, they were pretty much the biggest band of their area. And that's probably how they got spotted as well. But like, they signed up on Adrenaline. They had, they had quite a success, you know, yeah, especially for a debut record. Like, I when you when you look at the shows from the Adrenaline cycle. You can see so many people, so many people, like yeah, so many yeah. venues filled up, sold out, like shit, man, for a first record. That's amazing. And then I, I, like I said, I was too young. I wasn't around back then, but for around the fair, it sounds like it looks like they, they were exploding, you know, right. they were blowing up, like be quiet and drive seems to have been quite a hit on the rock scene. And, uh, and then White Pony, of course. Yeah. <laughs> that put them on the map forever. But it's interesting because they were big when they started off lo- locally. Uh, their records worked well. And then Lincoln Park, and Biscuit, Corn. I mean, they were already active in their own way, even though Deftones maybe started before anyone else. Uh, but yeah, these guys got bigger in a bigger quicker while deftones got progressively successful you know mm-hmm. they got a fame that it's it's kind of hard to say it's like they got a lot of people say that they never got the credit that they deserve and i agree to an extent but i think it's something that's happening gradually you know every new record there is this kind of implicit respect as to like holy shit this one band, Deftones, are coming out with new music. Check it out. And it doesn't feel like this mandatory, trendy band that you need to listen to. It's like, no, it's this well-respected rock band that's coming out with new music. It, it would be interesting to check it out. And, uh, I mean, just look at the success of Ohms, the music video. It's like almost 3 million views in uh, less than, than two weeks. That's, that's amazing, man. It's fucking amazing. It really I think. Is. I think Velvet Hammer, their management, they just posted something on Instagram about the song being the most replayed or something like that on Spotify. I'm not sure. Maybe not the most replayed, but something to that. Well, I've been so playing the hell out of it on Spotify. <laughs> I, I like it. I'm responsible it. for it. Did you of like those. it? I guess you liked it. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the video, too, uh, talking about the video. Uh, I never heard of Rafa Toon before. I think I said his name right. But that guy deserves an Oscar. Like that film, that video is a film. It's <laughs> that was pretty breathtaking. Great. Just spectacular, right? Very, very spectacular. Very, uh, and that, that caught me off guard because it's not something that I expect from a Death Sons music video, but it was very expansive. 
very yeah. very expensive very far out yeah and uh i was very i was pleasantly surprised with that video because uh i'm not necessarily the biggest fan of it even though i i totally respect the amount of work behind it because i can't even imagine but uh i was pre- pleasantly surprised because i know that they struggled to put control on that uh, on that aspect of their art a lot of the times you know they would come up with music videos when they would uh, fake perform and they would say this was corny and we didn't like it like i remember chi talking about the hole in the earth music video where he's like that was definitely uh, a digression <laughs> where it's like we're out there playing rock and space and sweating our faces when you can't even fucking sweat in space. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, he had a point cause like you could always, you could always see that their music videos, they didn't really put much thought into it oh, or so budget funny. or anything like that. So sure. for now for them to now to see them come, come out with a, with a full fledged, really well worked on music video. It's like, Okay, they they're back on the horse. They got the control again. This is this is great. This is gonna be yeah. This is gonna be a great cycle for this band. God, that's Music. something I hadn't given a whole lot of thought to. Uh, even though I guess I was vaguely aware of it because of the jokes that they'd made about my own summer that video and um, uh, it's for a band that has so many of the artistic nuances of their um platform like nailed like the album artwork um even down to like titles of the songs it all seems to be consistent um but with exception to videos like change was great i think uh yeah white, think white, or change digital was. bath was great like there's been good ones but not yeah. not with the same consistency that the other things the other aspects yeah. have had. and you know i can't i kind of like that because I mean, uh, obviously, I like video, and I would have I would have expected more from uh, from their video. But then again, we kind of joined that mystique thing we've been talking about. Mm-hmm. That to see such an expansive and interesting music, to have very not poor uh, material video, but just you know something it, it just makes you wonder like can it go further and then as a fan and as, as a video editor myself it kind of made me want to come up with my own things you know like sure. my own fan videos and there's a lot of them online man oh, there's yeah, so yeah. many people who've man fan videos of deftones like fuck and there's a couple of them who are really 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 good, really good. sex tape uh, is a good video that i could think of it's sort of weird with the with the underwater stuff or whatever yeah there's some good but yeah that's that's an interesting i mean Album artwork has always been super great. Uh, yeah. But the, yeah, the videos, I hadn't really thought about that before. But you know what? Shout, shout out uh, again, if he, if he listens to this, uh, shout out to Andrew Bennett. Uh, he's the guy who made uh, the Digital Bath music video. I uh, became friends with him in 2010, I think. And um, he also, he's also the one who made this movie who never came out that never came out i don't know if you heard about it it's called uh entertain me a film about deftones man that sounds so vaguely familiar like it sounds like yeah. something i probably heard about and then well basically uh andrew i think i could be wrong about this but i think he was friends with chino in high school oh. and on the white pony tour um he uh chino hired him uh, the label, I think, hired him for um, for a, a video project covering the White Pony tour. So he followed them, and he he recorded many many hours of live footage and uh, backstage stuff and all of that. I think it was from um, from maybe July July two thousand to like somewhere in two thousand and one, and he put he put his first his first uh, his first not. Well, yeah, I think I think Digital Bath was his first music video, and then uh, there was this whole this whole documentary that was made about that tour, but it never came out because uh, because the label uh, decided it was uh, too dark and too depressing. Oh, really? And uh, I can't. You know what? I've seen the movie, 
because it leaked at some point a, a rough cut a, a rough cut of it dropped uh years after the fact i think it's it's probably still available out there somewhere oh i gotta find that that sounds cool as hell even if it is unpolished I'll, i mean yeah i mean out of respect for andrew i know he doesn't like it because it's a rough cut but it's kind of <laughs> it, it's, uh, you know andrew it's not in his hands anymore <laughs> <laughs> Andrew is, I don't think is, is, is the kind of guy to look for fights, but he doesn't like to be stepped on. Sure. And when, when the label refused him the release, I think he was pissed, you know, I yeah. think he was pissed. And, and to such a point that he, he, he even, um, he sold the final cut on Vimeo and Warner or whoever was in charge busted him in one day like oh, it went on sale for one day and then it was gone uh i saw the final cut and i i can't i can kind of see like what the label meant when they when they say it was too dark and too depressing but to andrew's dis- discharge it was just very real you know sure it was very real documentation it wasn't polished it wasn't trying to make you it wasn't it wasn't trying to make you see the band for what it wasn't and that's what I love about this movie. It's very real. It's very honest. It's very well done. And um, and I was talking about him because Digital Bath is actually my my favorite Deftones music video. I think it's the... Yeah, man. I, I think it's the only video that makes me feel what the song makes me feel. That accompanies it really well. That, that's just my opinion, obviously. But I think those visuals really match... The vibe of the song it's not to say the others the other music videos uh aren't aren't good but when it comes to really meeting the vibe of the song uh, digital bab does it for me my second favorite would be hexagram i'm just, is is hexagram where they're out in the desert or is that minerva that's minerva and it's a great it's a great one as well it's a really it's a beautiful music video but I uh i don't remember the hexagram video off the top of my head it's it's a very it's a very basic uh, video of them playing playing live at their spot. They had they had thrown this announce on uh, online. They needed people to come to a uh, to a shooting. Oh, I and, remember uh, this. Yes. And there was even if you <laughs> if you look up the beginning of the Exagram music video, you see people in line queuing and getting into the the skate lab. And there's there's I think it was a girl who holds holds this sign that says Deftones World Rules, <laughs> and I never talked about this with Nuno who made Deftones World, but man, he must have been so psyched, <laughs> dude. No doubt. Well, so many things like Deftones World, and uh, I mean, I think they're the band's URL at that time was like Deftones Worldwide. So, um, like to everything seemed official you know what i mean no matter what it was because you could only get so much i bet yeah. she thought deftones uh deftones world was was a, a band thing and was also showing love i mean and, and a lot of that stuff was really well done and the only like resource that you could get to especially for somebody like me who didn't have friends to commiserate with or, or share information um not that i didn't have friends but again none of them went to deftones so um <laughs> yeah. like you got it where you could get it so that's uh, and and I and I should probably um, uh, backtrack a little bit on on sort of like shitting on all of their videos because the more I think about it now, like there are some hard, there are some really good videos in there. There's yeah, some, all this stuff. Cool. But. Like Minerva, like the landscape is beautiful. The budget was definitely there. I know they had issues with the with the sandstorms, uh, <laughs> but the the music video it ended up it ended up being real good. And I don't know if you heard about this, but. Uh, uh, Paul Fedor, the director of that video, he recently, I think it was this year, maybe last year, he uploaded his own cut of uh, the music video. Really? And it's not, you know, it's not, it's not drastically different. It's sure. obviously the it's same like setup. Not like of Justice League. But I, I prefer it. I prefer really? his cut. Yeah. Like, cool. there's a couple of moments. It's obviously there's this sense of novelty because you know this, these new shots you had never seen. But I think it's just the montage is really better done. I really prefer it. There's these uh, longer, smoother shots that fits the vibe of the song better. And also, the mix. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know why, but the mix of the song is different. And there's even one line that has a different lyric from the from really the, 
from the album version. I don't know where he got that mix. I don't know why he used that mix instead of the, the final one. But yeah, it's different. You should check it out. What's the, uh, what's the different lyric? Do you recall? Um, yeah, yeah, it was... You know this uh, this part, which you know goes uh, for the song you saved uh, every time you moan. Mm-hmm. For the song you say every time you moan. Well, instead of saying that on one of those times, he say, "Oh, f- for the hearts you break." Fuck, I, I forgot. But basically, instead of uh, every time you moan, he says every time you cry, and that's not on record. Wow. That's just the, shit. I love the, hearing about those little yeah <laughs> nuances, those little things that are different. Yeah, that's man. I feel like I'm 16 years old. Right? I know, right? <laughs> but like, uh, yeah, like this this mix is very different. Not only there's that different lyric, but the guitars, uh, the vocals have this filter that's not on the record. Uh, it sounds like it sounds like the vocals on Good Morning Beautiful. I Maybe think. they performed it live. No, wow. no, no! It, it's the same. It's the same studio cut. It's just produced different. It is. Wow! Yeah, check it out. Crazy. Minerva, Paul Fedor. The the video is different. Yeah. It's better, and the mix is is different as well. It's really good. Do you know there are former Deftones members? I I knew there was uh there was a drummer um other than Abe, and I think there was a bass player too prior to Chi. Correct? Absolutely, and I actually. I interviewed him two years ago. Oh, really? I interviewed him. His name is Dominic Garcia. Check him out. Uh, I think his ha- handle is Dominic G Garcia on Instagram. Uh, now he builds drums and he's an instructor. He does he does a great job. And uh, as a matter of fact, I feel re- really bad because a couple of months ago he asked me to uh, he asked me to repost an interview that was done of him. And I proposed to edit it, and I I'm still editing it. It's been a couple of months, and I've been I've been postponing because I'm such a lazy fuck. And I've been, <laughs> also also there there's so many things happening right now that I've been caught up. But yeah, he 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 has this amazing craft, man. He builds drums. He's an instructor, uh, and he plays. He has he has a couple. He had a couple different projects along the way. Uh, but yeah, I interviewed him a couple of years ago to find out about his history with Deftones. Because if you look, if you look up on Wikipedia, it's really vague, and it's almost impossible to find Deftones footage between their formation year and 1994, and that's like six years, six years where there's a total blank. We don't know shit. We only have a few pictures, a couple of interviews here and there. There's, I think there's like one clip from 1990 where, as a matter of fact, Dominic is on drums. Uh, but it's like one minute long. The full tape, I know it exists, but it never came out. Uh, so I wanted to find out. And I, I hit him up and uh, he was super quick to, uh, to make himself available. And yeah, we had this great, we had this crazy, crazy interesting interview about uh, his history with the band, and this, I mean, this is his version, and I would trust him. I have no reason not to trust him. Uh, but Deftones formed this way. Him, Dominic, and Abe were friends in high school. They were, they were in a marching band with an instructor, a drum instructor. His name was Kevin Goings. Uh, apparently this guy was super thorough, very, very, uh, intense kind of a drum teacher. Uh, and that probably explains why Abe is such a beast on drums as well. There's talent, you know, but I think maybe his instructor played a uh, played role, but, uh, anyway, so they were, they were very buddies in high school and they were in a marching band in classes together and they would, they would go at Abe's place and they would jam. Uh, Abe had this, had a PB amp, uh, that, um, uh, that Dominic would plug himself in because he was a bassist at that point. He was a big fan of Iron Maiden. And uh, they would jam together, just him and Abe. And Stefan was riding his bike all around the Sacramento block. And uh, it will always pass by. And at some point, like they knew that he was a guitarist. He he was a guitar player. And (laughs) at some point, Abe stuck his head out of the window when he saw Steph Steph pass by and was like, yo, man, come and jam. And uh, that was pretty much the basis, I think, 
how it all started. These three guys getting together. Uh, so yeah, it's hard to imagine Stefan like riding his bike around. Yeah, Sacramento, <laughs> probably passively trying to get invited in to jam. You know what I mean? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> like riding around with his guitar on his back, like like a desperado or something. You know what I mean? That's, that's yeah, I I don't I don't think he had his guitar on his back because. <laughs> What what I heard what I heard is that he would he would open his garage at his, at his mom's place and he would just throw out random jam sessions you know inviting buddies from high school probably sure. I don't know yeah but yeah. I think I think that's what he would do and uh, and sometimes Dominic would go there but maybe maybe not I, I don't want to quote him on this because I don't remember so well but uh, yeah that's pretty much how those three guys got together and should you know that Chino was not even going to be the singer at first. Um, they, they were uh, big into... They, those guys, they, they had Steph, Abe, and Dominic. They came from two specific worlds, the hip-hop world and the metal world. Mm -hmm. And when they were playing music, these two things would clash, you know? And they were considering uh, hiring a guy, a rap vocalist for that. So his name was Gilbert. And um, they auditioned him, and it went good. But then at some point, uh, I think it was, who was it? Who actually invited Chino to audition? I'm not sure. But he auditioned with uh, Dominic, Abe, and Abe. Uh, Dominic, Abe, and Stefan. And it was, that, that pretty much sealed the deal, you know? He, he had, like, this crooning Morrissey thing going on over their heavier riffs. And uh, it got, it started from there. And then at some point, uh, Abe left the band to go tour with Fallacy, another band from uh, Sacramento. Um, Dominic took over on drums because he was, uh, you know, he was also uh, learning drums. And this is when uh, Chi, uh, this is when Chi got in. Like uh, at some point, I don't remember who it was, but someone moved in with Chi uh, on campus. Yeah, I think it was Chino. Yeah, 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 I, yeah, yeah, you're probably right. Uh, and then, yeah, they invited Chi to, uh, to audition and, and Dominic kind of, uh, kind of coached him, you know, because he had been the basis before. Yeah. And, uh, but he had, he had everything right off the bat. He had the style, he had, uh, the playing, he had the attitude and, uh, and yeah, then, and then, yeah, well, he told me this, so I think it's okay to say it. Uh, they kicked him out. Like. Stefan kicked Dominic out of the band. Yeah. Uh, and then they had another drummer, John Taylor, that was his name. Oh, really? Who uh, he played in the band from 1991 to 1993. Then Abe came back, and I don't know how it happened, uh, but basically Abe took, took his spot back. John, uh, I don't know if he left on his own accord, or if he was let go of, uh, but um, Abe came back. And that was pretty much, obviously, until Chi's accident in 2008, that was pretty much the Alive. definitive formation of Deftones. Thank God he came back, because it's not them unless it's got that bop. And that bop yeah. is so singular to Abe. It's absolutely just such a tremendous... And I've, I've wondered uh, about that period plenty of times not just the formation but that like you said six or seven years where there's no like Nothing. record like they're, and they were performing all around town as as you know as Dude, they, they it, were right? touring like crazy they were playing many many shows in the in the sector area uh i think it didn't take them i think it, it took them maybe a year to start playing in san francisco uh or maybe two years i don't know but uh I know Dominic told me this. He told me that the first show they ever played, the first Deftones show, is actually on tape. It exists. Whoa, it's, really? It's somewhere. And he, he might have a copy. And I, I've bugged him a couple of times about it. But, you know, I don't like being, uh, I don't like being a piss about this. Sure. So, you know, I don't want to harass him either. But I'm definitely curious, you know? Yeah. And, it's, and he told me that right off the bat, the kids went crazy. At the first Deftones show, everyone went insane. It was like, I think... It, it was a pay, it was some kind of a, a deal where you had to sell your own tickets uh, to, to like, play. 
yeah like they would offer you the tickets and the spot and you would need to sell your tickets and uh they they sold out they sold out it was like maybe 300 people and he told me that <laughs> he, he remember watching dominic remember remembers watching the video and you can see a girl holding her beer before they kick in and as soon as they kick in you can see uh the girl being uh being knuckled and like having <laughs> having her beer splashing and she's like oh fuck. and the marsh starts and like kids are going crazy awesome that's tremendous god i would love to see that video those those early years are are um intriguing to me just given the fact that they were so dynamic right out the gate or at least well you know out the gate on yeah on man. youtube 96 95 96 whenever we start getting those first performances uh i mean explosive right like absolutely that, that had to be honed over that six or seven year period you know what my my favorite deftones recording is wembley 2003 which i um for the real story i i i met the guy who recorded that show, which was legendary to me. I met him a couple of weeks ago. I bought him his master tape, the actual wow. master tape that got out of the camera when he got out of the show. I, uh, I bought it and I, I, I uploaded a master copy on, the, on YouTube if you're interested. I'm, but the, I'm actually, I'm looking for it as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> it's Just a very recent upload. It. And yeah, it's, it's, it's basically the master copy. Um, the sound is a little better because I had no source and the, the contributor, his name is Matt Rogers, uh, did the, the remastering aspect of, of the thing. But um, yeah, that's my favorite Deftones uh, recording. But I think a show that the one show that I really like after that is San Jose 1994, before probably before they even signed. That, you know what? Lots of people would disagree, but that was probably my favorite performance as far as Chino's vocals went. In 1994, he sounded amazing. Yeah, those adrenaline songs they sounded so true to the record, yeah. especially vocally. You know, he had this tone, this crazy screaming, this consistency that you would maybe not see see so often, so often uh, after some time. Yeah, um, but. And yeah, I, I love this recording because it was such a tiny club. I think Chino one time on an interview he said, you know what, those little clubs before even our first record came out, that's where we shine, man. Yeah. And I agree. I agree. Like there was something about those early shows. They were fuck. You know what? My favorite performance of board where Chino is like 100% like on the record to the point it gives you chills. Uh, it comes from a 90, 1995 show. And yes, it is on my channel. It's uh, the Night Theater in, I think it was in Mesa in Arizona. Yeah. 1995. They open with board and Chino's vocal performance is like, holy shit. That's like, you know, all these people, because with all the vocal issues that he's got, obviously he's got a, rep he's got a reputation now, you know, where yeah. people are going to be like, his hit or miss. And I've, I've had that a lot. Being the manager of Deftones Live, I've had that a lot. Some people who are not fans of Deftones are going to be like, oh, this guy, he sounds really bad. He sounds like shit and blah, blah, blah. And he can't sing. But you know what? Those early shows, they weren't the only shows he sounded good at, but that's a fucking big proof that he is a good singer. He has the talent and he definitely at least had the technique. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. The, these, these shows were really something else. It's such a shame there's not a lot from that time. I was listening to um, to the performance that they their first performance in Minneapolis uh, from '95. That's on your page with um, that's on your channel. It's uh, they're opening on the Anthrax. It's like Anthrax and Life of Agony. Yes, it's the Anthrax Life of Agony tour, and it's it's their first performance in Min in Minneapolis where I where I live. And uh, you don't even the place doesn't even exist anymore. Uh, I think it was called the Mirage or something. Yeah, it's just the, the audio. It's like just the sound. The con it must be the control board audio uh that you managed to get and it's like uh actually it was a shout out to jay i <laughs> you know what i i found him i found this guy maybe a year ago and this show had been listed on the internet for probably 20 years and but this one this one is one of the few 
I think he has he has recorded maybe six or seven Deftones shows total. Yeah. And this is one of the maybe two that he ever got out there. There are five of them that he never actually traded. And wow, uh, really, and he, he's uh, he's given me a copy of half of the batch. I'm still waiting for the rest, but um, <laughs> I know it, I know it's gonna come. Shout out to Jay. <laughs> Shout out to Jay. He's a great dude. That's uh, cool. And yeah, this uh, the show at the Mirage. Yeah, it's it's great. I mean, and this whole. I mean, there, there was a couple actually, they're not necessarily on YouTube, but there was a couple of uh, recordings from early '96 or playing '995, and that's that was really you know adrenaline live, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, oh, like, yeah. there was a shitload of uh, 1996 footage on YouTube, and that's also very adrenaline like. But 1995 is really with this whole vibe was 100. percent I can't explain it. I can't explain why. It was brand new, right? I mean, it was still uh, yeah, the well, album was probably was still very fresh. Still fresh. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. something to that time where it's probably, I mean, even in that uh, that McDonald's parking lot performance that to me has always been so legendary. Um, it, he's like, man, we've been doing this for seven years, and we're playing in a McDonald's parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> and it, but it's like, yeah, that's 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 real, and and they were doing something that was. Uh, I don't want to say it was unprecedented, but that performance, it, it was so unique and singular and brand new. Uh, yeah, that man. was, that was really, and even to this day, to be honest with you, I, I know that you've said that you're not like a, a huge fan of the Sergio era uh, band or um, however you like, but um, I think that there's still something that's extremely magnetic and electrifying about their performance. Hell, the one that I saw in 2016, uh, I think they must've been touring Gore then. Yeah, they were touring Gore monster 21 song set chino's in the crowd screaming his face off and it's like th this band still does that they still yeah. do that you know what i mean it's yeah no yeah. like it's i mean i i still i i will still attend as many shows as i can but when it comes to the archiving i don't have the same craving for yeah. that yeah. i can't i can't really I explain that. it and i don't i don't i don't think i need to justify myself but you know it, it may be just place. plain nostalgia you know but even just in terms of uh, of sound you know like, uh, not to this search, he does, he does a great job. He's a great bass player. He brings something different. He has his own style. And it's actually very respectable that he's un, he doesn't try to, uh, you know, to replicate what she did. Mm. But, uh, I mean, yeah, if, if yeah. you're going to give me an actual choice, like, like it's actually possible, of course, I'm going to pick the one with Chi, like, honestly. But I'm, I'm just grateful that they still exist and we're still making music. Man. For real. Absolutely. I couldn't have said that better myself. Um, I do want to ask you uh, one more thing about the live show, since you're really uh, probably the expert to, yep. to talk about their live shows. Uh, is the mix in the live show and uh, specific to Frank? Um, and I think about a lot of the songs when I, as I've been over the course of the pandemic, devouring everything on your channel or as much as my <laughs> wife will give me time to. Um, something that has stood out is, is, uh, is Frank's mix is a lot higher. He's a lot more present in the live performance than he is, or than maybe he seems to be on, on uh, record. I think about um, stuff in particular to that uh, uh, self-titled era. Um, what, what am I thinking about? Uh, when girls telephone boys, maybe. <laughs> I know, I know what you're thinking about. Like there's, but that's not the only one. There's like other ones. Yeah, Chains, no, but you actually, from... you're actually confusing it because... It, it is definitely that song, but it was another era. Um, if, you, if you check out uh, live recordings from, um, from the self-titled era, Frank's effects are pretty much, pretty much on the same level as on the record mm -hmm. at, at that time. But if you check out 2006 footage from when Saturday Night Riz was out, when they would play When Girls Style from the Boys in Instagram, Frank was a lot more, a lot more, uh, a lot louder for sure. And I think that was a, yeah, I think that was a conscious choice. Uh, if you're talking about, well, so when you ask, uh, is the, is the mix up to Frank, you mean the whole band's mix? Well, um, no, just noticing that his, his, he's louder in the mix and seems to be more, um, at the, not at yeah. the forefront, but uh, more prevalent, more obvious, more hearable than he is. Yeah, on, on I, I, I think that was definitely a, a conscious choice where, because if, I mean, 
the way I see it, Frank uh, has been gradually making his way into the sound of this band. You know, mm. it, start, it started off with really small contributions on Adrenaline, like on Minus Blindfold. And uh, and even that's super interesting if you're a Deftones fan. Like they would play Nosebleed in the around the first cycle and Frank would add these um, this weird kind of kind of angry bird effect in the breakdown that they would not do on the adrenaline tour and then there were there was there were these couple of differences that you would you would only catch if you listen to those recordings or would see them live you know yeah. and frank yeah he's been really smooth and really subtle in his way to to you know to uh to incorporate his craft um what i really like about him is that he seems to make his own samples yeah. And uh, he really has such a great taste for that, you know. He really has a sense. It's like he's a great. Seems like he would be. He would be a great beat maker. Um, yeah. But yeah, to answer your question, I think I think that that's up to him, definitely. Yeah. Is that because it, it seems like a conscious? Okay. And then my follow up to that is, do you think it's better? Do I think it's better? Like when you hear his instrument his contribution being larger in those uh you know 2006 or later performances do you do you um you know what it's a it's it's a very interesting question because i i remastered hexagram as a matter of fact i i don't know if you caught that on deftones live but i had made this version where i made uh i made frank's effects more prevalent like did like you? those live versions. Yeah. What I did is that I, uh, his effects on, on hexagram always made me, uh, always re- reminded me of a violin. So what I did is that I, don't, I, I downloaded a sample of a violin. I arranged the pitch depending on the moment of the song. And I added some kind of a robotic kind of effect to it. And it pretty much... I. Honestly, I think I did a pretty good job. <laughs> I, awesome. I think, like, I'm going to give you the link. I'm going to drop it on your Zoom chat. Yeah, that's, that would be great. That's so cool. Yeah, I uploaded it in 2015. Perfect. But, yeah, to answer that question, um, if I think it's better... I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know because hearing it so much louder, it definitely does something. It definitely improves the intensity and it's not a bad thing. It's something that I like. But, and I did the same with When Girls Telephone Boys, by the way, but I, I think I removed that from YouTube. But someone ended up re uploading it. But I, I like it. But also, I like the fact I really like the fact that on the record he is not he is in the background of things because the music on the self title record is so fucking intense like yeah there is there isn't a Deftones record that sounds heavier so for Frank to drop a subtle you know subtle addition to that something that just that's just right the way it should be you're like man that's some smoothness right there so yeah. then again I this one remaster that I made, I like it. I like it a lot. So do I, pre- I don't know which one I prefer. <laughs> I like them both for, for their own reasons. There's a lot of fans. If you check out the comments that are like, man, can you do, can you do the same on Death Blow? There's so yeah. many other songs where Frank should be louder. And it's not so much a matter of should be, you know, I think if you had wanted to be or felt like he should have been, he would have been. Yeah, but it's it's up to eat to everyone's preferences. As far as I go, I don't really have one. One, it's just it's just something as a fan. I think kind of it's easy to geek out on and get nerdy with. Just to oh, think yeah. about like, oh well, well this version of the song is different, and was that intentional? And is is the band uh, what what were the what were the thinking behind those choices? And you know, a lot of things uh, come to mind. And just hearing something that you've heard a thousand times, a little yeah. bit different you know <laughs> so yeah go uh, ahead one of the things that um i've been asking everybody um because uh it, it's it's something that profound that struck me in listening to a podcast uh, chino was on and he said you know i don't i don't do a lot on on social media because i don't want to be beholden to it uh, but he does tweet out 
YouTube links because he thinks that it's one of the coolest things that you could get from uh, your favorite band or from an artist that you follow is, you know, links to stuff that they like. Yeah. Yeah. So a question that I uh, have been posing is, uh, I wonder if you could give me three recommendations, sort of in that same spirit of, of sending people to a, a place, uh, whether it's a, uh, and it could, it could be absolutely anything, old or new. Um, I mean, you've already given us a ton, given some of these, uh, these links. Um, you mean music recommendations or... Anything Literally all. anything you want. It could be music. It could be old. It could be new. It could be a poem. It could be a type of alcohol. I, I had uh, somebody recommend some, uh, I think it was rum <laughs> this past week. Uh, uh, so literally anything. What Three recommendations. Okay. Well, I'm going to be a bit serious about this, <laughs> but uh, right. all right then. Um, so there's this one album that I've, I've tried to spread as much as I could ever since I heard it because it's so in uniquely, incredibly good. And <laughs> if the band heard this, maybe they would cringe or maybe they would like it. I don't know. But uh, uh, it's called, uh, I don't know how you pronounce this, actually. It's a, I know it's an English word, but is it mare? Uh, you know, I think it's the... How do you spell it? I think it's the female of the horse. A mare? Oh, a mare, yeah, a mare. Yeah. Well, the band is called Mare, and uh, it's a self-titled EP, as a matter of fact. It's the only only piece of music they ever dropped. I think it was in 2004. This album, this EP is, oh my God, it's awesome. so fucking good. Um, I can't describe it. That's also why there's such an appeal to that. I can't describe this music. There's definitely metal elements but there's like there's these this incredible mix this really well done mix of jazz and metal and it's not something like dillinger or botch you know it's like it's not that heavy or that that fucking hard in the face it's man i can't describe it it's so good it's so fucking good there's a couple of different mares on Spotify, but I don't, who knows which one it is. I'm all right. That's, that's going to be a little homework. Okay. Uh, Terrific. Well, that's, so that's why. Are, are they, are they on Spotify? I would, I wouldn't. Maybe. I mean, they are. Uh, uh, mayor, 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 mayor. You know, who knows? Oh yeah. Well, DEP is there. I don't know if it's official. Oh yeah, it is by Idra Head. Yeah. 2005. That was their label. I think, uh, yeah, the EP is there. You you type Mare EP and you'll find it. It's 24 minutes long, five songs. They they take you places. <laughs> it's all I can cool. all I can really say. It's 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 beautiful. Uh, second would be. We live in a very very stressful times at the moment, and I. I can't talk from experience because my anxiety is all over the place. So relax, sit back, be able to take the sounds in. And if you're sensitive to that, check out, check out ASMR. Uh, I love ASMR. <laughs> it's, ASMR? It's, yeah. You don't know what it is? No. Well, uh, I see a lot of people being reluctant to it because it's such a new, it's such a different concept, but it's basically a, uh, I don't think it's mostly girls, but it's mostly, it's mostly girls that I've watched, to be honest. But uh, it's people, they, they make sounds. It could be anything. It can be like uh, just whispering or making sounds with their, with their fingers or uh, rubbing, rubbing some wood, rubbing a, rubbing a surface, anything at all. Uh, they just want to make sounds that activate some kind of... Uh, some kind of response in your brain. ASMR, it stands for Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. Basically, you ever had this experience where you hear a sound and you have chills or sure. like tingles in the sure. brain? Well, that's the focus. They, that's what they're going for. Awesome. And they, they want to provoke that in the people who check them out uh, by doing anything. It can, like I said, can be whispering, uh, touching a, a matter that, you know, because they call that triggers, you know, mm -hmm. and if anything can trigger those and it's different for everyone. 
Like you're going to, you're going to be sensitive to a certain kind of voice. I'm going to be sensitive to a different kind of voice, a different kind of sound. And they are all over YouTube. You check out ASMR. All right. And maybe you won't, maybe you will like it. It's, it's something to take in. You know, if you're not used to that kind of stuff at first, you're going to be weirded out. But <laughs> if you, if you're able to sit back and just see it for what it is, that is just people who are trying to spread some good. Uh, it's nothing. It sounds nothing. a little like meditation. A little bit, yeah. A little bit. It's it's something to that to that effect, definitely. Okay. Uh, and yeah, so that's I, I mean, know this this helps me out a lot. I've been checking it out for like maybe a year or two. That's great. And it's it's it helps me out a lot with my anxiety and yeah, it's great. Uh, uh third thing. Uh, the third thing is always the hardest thing. But it can be easy. It can it can also be super easy. You don't have to. I don't. I don't. You don't have to bend over backwards, do backflips to figure it out. What is something? I don't know. I, I just want to give a tip that really helps out. Uh, it's yeah. In my opinion, it's not a place you should go. It's rather a place you should stay off. Don't watch too much news. Mm. don't look up too much news like we know things are fucked up and we're sensitive beings we we read a couple more and we're convinced that the world is fucked i know i'm like that you know it gets too negative i'm convinced that i'm done for obviously i have my own bias and my own background that makes me the person i am i know that p some people manage to keep a pma positive mental attitude mm. but we're in a we're in more realist times i believe and uh, we're way more prone to depression and uh, mental uh, mental problems than before. So stay off the news, read a book, check out your favorite CD, spend time with your partner, girlfriend, boyfriend. Uh, put yourself first. Go to that place where you feel good. That's that's really all I can say. That that would be the first thing. Go to that place where you feel good and you do yourself some good. Man, I had so much fun talking to Vezenik. I, I really hope you took a pee break, by the way. I had to go so bad after we got off Zoom. Crazy, man. Uh, I am extremely grateful to Vezenik for sharing his time and his stories with me, especially the one he's got to wrap up the show. Oh, no, we're not done yet. Uh, but I do want to point out that his combat story he forgot to mention after they finished playing it, and these are his words. Uh, Chino said, motherfucker said we couldn't play it. That's what they said. And then he stepped on his little uh, estrade there and scanned the front row where, where Vezenik was, spotted him, pointed his finger at him, and he said, this motherfucker right here. And ironically asked him, is it okay with you if we play a song from White Pony? Uh, before they kicked into Elite. So that's how he knew their previous conversation was a part of the reason they played it live. But then again, uh, he said when a buddy of his who was also at the show brought it up to Frank, Frank said they always do something special in Amsterdam. So draw your own conclusions. I like Vezenik's version of events uh, myself. My sincerest thanks to Vezenik. In a lot of ways, his YouTube channel was the impetus for this podcast, which has brought me tremendous joy. And I am beyond grateful for that. Uh, okay, finally, as we end our marathon here, ask yourself this. If you had the opportunity to request a song from Deftones for them to play live, how awkward could it get? Well, you know what? I want to come clean about something. I've addressed this before on my on my socials, but uh, I just I just want to make sure there's no misunderstanding. Uh, it's actually something I'm a little ashamed of, but kind of need to come clean about this. In 2013, I went to 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 a show, Deftones show, it was in Paris at the Trianon, the Trianon, and they played there two nights in a row. And at the time, I was um, I was friends with uh, one of their uh, crew members, and it just happened like that. You know, I didn't seek out for that for that friendship. It just it just happened. And the guy I won't mention him, although I know the hardcore fans will uh, will connect the dots. But uh, out of respect, I will not mention him. But I. You know, I was so into the idea of hearing Pink Maggot live, as we discussed uh, earlier, that I, 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 went up straight to, I went up straight to him and I said, look, man, I'm pretty sure that if I don't ask the band myself, I'm never going to hear this song. All I'm asking you is put me in a room with, you know, with one of them 
all of them, I don't care. You know, I'm not the kind of uh, I'm not the kind of poster boy to go look for a, a fucking picture or like I don't care. I really don't give a shit. I just want to ask them for that song and then I'm out of here. And so he, you know, he, he hesitated. Obviously, it's not something a fan would uh, would usually ask. And that's such fucking balls. <laughs> what the fuck? Really just is. just thinking, just thinking about it. I'm like, dude, how the fuck did you do that? <laughs> but but no, like, so, um, so he uh, he went outside for a minute, then he came back and he was like, okay, follow me. So we went at the back of the venue and, you know, I'm tripping out. I'm like, fuck, is this really happening? What the hell? <laughs> and, you know, I had, I had quickly met them before, but it's the whole experience of being taken there by the crew member. You're like, yeah. what the fuck? Dude, I shouldn't have asked for this. I, 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 was, I was not responsible enough for this, honestly. What happened is that they, they got me there. I was, I was high as fuck. <laughs> I did not feel good, man. I was a freak. I was pale in the fucking face. I was thin like a corpse. <laughs> I I looked like shit. So I went up to Chino. He was playing some uh, he was playing some music on his on his laptop. Uh, Frank was zoning out in the, in the couch uh, on the smartphone. And I I went up there. I went I went in that lounge. I had uh, I had seen Steph in the in the stairs going up to that lounge. Uh, he, he had seen me and he had said hi to me, but. You know, he didn't come back to the lounge. So it was just, at that point, it was just Chino and Frank. And then I, I'm there. I have no fucking idea what to do. <laughs> I'm like, am I even there? I didn't believe it. So there was a, there was a couple of uh, couches there. It was a really kind of a, kind of chillax kind of lounge. Like it was some, some old living room or some shit. It was pretty, pretty great. But I, I was like, this is weird. What, what am I doing? I was so nervous, man. It was ridiculous. Oh my God, I'm cringing so hard. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I sit in one of the couches and I'm like, okay, what now? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> am I, I going to bother Chino who's just playing music on his fucking laptop to ask um, him? Hey, Chino, um, <laughs> do you think you could play a song for me? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what happened. <laughs> Oh man! So I like, do. I can't do this. Uh, so Sergio comes out. He, he puts a bandage around his ankle, and we kind of we kind of chat. We kind of say, say something to each other, and he's like super cool about it. He, he seems he seems a bit surprised to see me, but he doesn't bug out. Uh, and then Abe comes out, and that's always the best. Seeing Abe, man, he's such a spaz. Like he sees me, he uh, he's like, "Yo, man, get up, get up!" And he takes me by the hand, and he like shoulders me, and he's like, "You okay? You good?" And all. Like, He's always such a spaz, always so funny to be around. Like That's he's so always cool. so cool with the fans. But then I'm like, dude, I have no idea what I'm doing. So I I see the, the, the crew member who had got me there, he's on the balcony having the smoke of a colleague. And I, you know, I take a smoke out of my own packet and I go on the balcony and I just join them being totally silent. I'm like, dude, what the fuck? pissing myself here. <laughs> this is so fucking awkward. He pretty much tells me, man, you gotta, you know, if you want to, if you want, if you want to ask, you better ask now because you go, you can't, you can't like, you can't like hang out for, uh, for yeah. a very long time. And I'm like, okay, that's the cue. So I go to Chino, and I, that's that's exactly what you just said, what you just mimicked. That's exactly what happened. I'm like, <laughs> like, hey, Chino, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, I had, oh fuck, <laughs> you know, like your music got me through a lot of rough stuff and. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you my life, but like I have this song and like I'm totally disheveled and totally inconsistent in my speech. And it basically cuts me short in my speech. And he's like, so you really like that song? Huh? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I do. I do. And like, and you want us to play it live? I'm like, I mean, yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> and he's like, OK, man, we'll do it. And I think, you know, maybe they rehearsed it. I have no idea. But uh, I had the. Or maybe I was just being a paranoid, but I had the feeling that he said that just to get rid of me. And honestly, I wouldn't blame him because I was, I looked like a fucking freak. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, but obviously they didn't play it. And the next day, you know, I mean, your favorite singer telling that to you, it kind of means something, you know, you don't actually expect him to do it. Yeah. But if he says he's going to do it, you're like, you kind of expect it a little, you know, you're like, oh, yeah. 
and they didn't do it and that's where i fucked up i i was mad that they yeah. didn't not only they didn't do it so i felt like i had been lied to but uh i was way too sensitive about this but yeah. i think i've changed since then hopefully i've gotten um less emotional about things but uh <laughs> that's a hard moment man that's a hard moment um i i've had a similar experience um when i got to interview Chino and Sergio um, at the uh, Knot Fest in Wisconsin, the first year they started doing uh, uh, Knot Fest. And I was just so nervous. And then I got to, like, I got that escort onto their bus and I'm, and I'm, I could smell the weed and I'd already like met Abe and it was just an amazing experience. Yeah. But I was yeah. so nervous, you know what I mean? That nervous. The key is to, to play in a cool is to just decide in advance, I think, that you're not going to let that out. You know what I mean? That you're not going to <laughs> profess your love. Because as soon as you do, you go, it, the, it, it's a slippery slope, man. It's a slippery I, slope. Yeah, for real. And honestly, that's, that's also one of, that's another reason why I'm not into their personal shit. It's not like, yeah, I really want to leave things where they should be. Everything in its right place, to quote Radiohead. You know, it's like, yeah. This is just about the live music and nothing else. And yeah. that's, you know, even though my request was super fucking awkward, that's, that's, what I, that's what I wanted it to be. I wanted, I wanted to see the guy, ask him straight up, yo, can you play that song? I'm out. You know, yeah. I'm out. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you how much I love your music or but how it's much there. my life. Except if you want to hear about it, like, okay. <laughs> but like, you know, I'm not, like, I don't want to be that guy. Not only if I didn't play it, but I, I thought, I thought the performance was really poor mm. and I was, man, I was such in a bad mood. Like uh, I was struggling with that fucking stupid addiction. I had just had a call from my landlord who wanted me to get rid of my cat who I loved so much. Mm. Uh, yeah, no, I was, I was in a bad spot. And uh, so I got pissed. Honestly, I, I, I let anger took the best out of me and I, I threw this post. It was on my old page before it was Deftones Live, where I pretty much, I pretty much shat on them. I crapped on them big time, totally dismissing the fact that the crew member had been so nice that he let me in the lounge. I was such an ass, and uh, well, what happened happened. You know, like he, he called me out publicly on his own Facebook page. Uh, we stopped being friends, and uh, and that was the end of that. You know. Yeah. Um, that sucks. I mean, luckily, since then, I, I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't stupid enough to ignore that forever. So at some point, I realized what I had done. I made my amends. I put out a couple of statements. Uh, heartfelt, by the way. Uh, I, I reached out to him and I apologized for what I did. And I, I don't think, you know, I don't think it's gonna be, it's ever gonna be like before. But. Uh, you know, yeah, it's just an experience that I like to look back on and realize that I've grown from because, uh, man, that was so fucking stupid. But yeah. it's hard, dude. It's well, hard. it was part, it was part of my growth. So, you know, yeah. there's regret, but I needed to go through there somehow, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, other than that, no, I don't have really. I think that's really cool that you offered that up um, uh, for me and for us uh, on this podcast because I think that. Um, you know, growth is, is, uh, it's a part of life and mistakes and, and, Absolutely. and, um, doing it in a public way is, uh, it makes it even harder. It, it certainly makes it more challenging. So I really appreciate you, uh, putting yourself out there like that. That's, that's really cool. Thank you. Cheers, mate. All right. That's it. Thanks again to Vezenique. Please follow, subscribe, come back next week. I'm going to speak with Cyrus King from this be the verse about the time that he went home from Wembley with Chino's guitar so cool my name is woody you can find me at woodbra on instagram or twitter if you want to talk about the show thank you for listening to deftones and thank you for listening to change in the house of pods